All right, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Taylor, and I work for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Uh, and we are excited for um, session three of this year's Water Watch Lecture Series um, entitled Shad, America's Founding Fish. Um, and so uh, before we begin, um, the North and South Rivers, if you're not familiar, we are a small conservation nonprofit whose mission is to preserve and protect uh, our most valuable natural resource. Um, through education, engagement, scientific uh, programs and monitoring, we work to um, ensure that there is uh, clean, healthy waters for people, for our communities, for our wildlife. And we've been doing so since 1970, uh, and we will continue to do so um, uh, today, tomorrow, and forever. So um, so thanks for joining us uh, for educational programs uh, like this on our Wednesday evenings. Um, uh, Brief shout out to our sponsors for this program. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to Clean Harbors once again, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, Marshfield, Duxbury, Pembroke, and Rockland. Uh, once again, thank you to our sponsors for their continued support of educational programs like this. Um, and so um, tonight, um, as always, I am joined by a, uh, a representative from Mass Audubon. And, uh, and so tonight we are joined uh, by Steve French. And uh, Steve, why don't you go ahead and share a few words and I got your screen up there for you. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Um, Yes, I'm Steve French with uh, Mass Audubon, and uh, we are one of the nonprofits here in Massachusetts. And our mission is to protect the nature of Massachusetts for people and wildlife. And our greatest uh, conservation challenges uh, immediately are climate change, loss of biodiversity, and the nature equity gap. And we are working on a five-year plan to address each one of those. So I'm happy to be here tonight. And this series has been wonderful so far. And on this slide, you can see these are some of the programs that we offer. This is just a snapshot of February. So any of you that are interested in joining us on any one of these bird walks, or if you want to come out to one of our lecture series, we do talk about raptors this, this month. And we also have this birding in a changing climate, which talks about climate change and, you know, the effects that it's having on birds. And on the 15th, we work in collaboration with the Watershed Association. So if you have free time, please join us. Back over to you. Thanks, Steve. Um, I've been on several of Mass Audubon's birding programs with Steve and Doug Lowry, as well as other Audubon educators. Fantastic programs, as always. Um, so uh, tonight we are joined um, by two very knowledgeable um, individuals uh, who I will introduce, um, who are going to be talking about Chad tonight. So to start, um, I'd like to introduce James Gardner, uh, a UMass Amherst PhD candidate with the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, James has a, uh, uh, he graduated with a BA from uh, uh, University of Colorado Boulder, uh, uh, ecology and uh, biology, uh, masters in biology from uh, BU, and he has is currently a student contractor for the USGS, uh, as well as a teaching assistant for UMass Amherst. Um, uh, James also was a, a ecology program director at the Jones River Watershed Association, uh, just south of our watershed. Uh, they do great work down there as well, as well as the watershed ecologist with Jones River. Um, he also is a diadermous fisheries technician, well, was back in 2019. So his interests center around developing accessible and equatable use-inspired biodiversity diversity and fisheries abundance monitoring tools that utilize environmental DNA or eDNA technology. Um, and he's working with partners and stakeholders to address questions related to shifts in aquatic community compositions in response to restoration and climate um, adaptation actions, as well as calibrating eDNA techniques to standardize fisheries, uh, abundance estimation metrics to provide low cost alternatives to fishery managers, as well as utilizing eDNA techniques to track population levels as well. And, and lastly, evaluate um, a turnkey field deployable biodiversity monitoring system that offers more affordable and equitable 
alternatives to traditional monitoring approaches. Um, the data that James is collecting from his research can be directly applied towards understanding how aquatic communities and diadromous, which we will learn what that means, fisheries responds to management, climate change, human adaptations. Uh, human adaptations to climate change as well. So um, thank you so much, James, for joining us tonight. And we are also joined by John Shepard uh, with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. So John grew up in Boston. He's a lifelong fisherman and outdoor enthusiast. Probably have a few of those here. His passion for fishing and his uh, favorite movie, Jaws, <laughs> led him to pursue a career it, uh, as a fisheries biologist. He earned his bachelor's degree in fisheries science at, at the University of Rhode Island in 96 and earned his master's degree uh, in marine fisheries and science uh, at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland um, in 99. So his professional career began while working during college as a summer employee for the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries and Wildlife. He then went to work for the Fisheries Observer program at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in 2000 and then began working for uh, the Mass DMF in 2001 um, in the Fisheries Department Investigations Project. So uh, then in 2005, he transferred to the Diadromous Fisheries Biology and Management Project and is now overseeing several monitoring programs for diadromous species uh, in southeastern Massachusetts. So in two very incredibly knowledgeable uh, gentlemen here joining us tonight, thanks to the both of you uh, for joining. And um, John, you can go ahead and share your screen and uh, and take it away. Thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. Yep, look, looks good to okay. me, John. Uh, yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, again, my name is John Shepard. I'm with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, and so um, I'm a diadromous fisheries biologist and, um, you know, and um, as the uh, lecture, uh, you know, uh, subject, you know, I'm going to talk about certainly one of my, uh, one of my favorite fish, uh, the American shad. And so for my talk, I'm going to talk, uh, briefly summarize um, the life history and distribution of American shad. And then I'm going to talk about their populations um, and management. I'm going to take it from both a uh, coast-wide uh, federal scale and then take it down to the state and local level. I'll talk a bit about my organization um, and uh, the type of work we do uh, for uh, diadromous fish and particularly for shad in terms of monitoring, um, propagation and enhancement, as well as restoration efforts. And then I'll I'll close it out with uh, just talking about some future di directions. So first to really start off, um, American shad, they belong to a, a, a category of fish known as diadromous fish. And so diadromous fish are, are species that spend portions of their life cycles in both freshwater and in saltwater environments. They're essentially divided into two categories, uh, one being anadromous, and these are fish that are born in freshwater they spend most of their lives out at sea and then return to freshwater to spawn. Um, and so American, American shad uh, actually fall under this category. So in terms of their distribution, um, American shad, they range from Canada to Florida. As you can see on the map on the left here, this kind of shows their, um, their spawning migrations. And so, or I should say their migratory life cycles. And so each spring, the adults make spawning migrations from the marine waters into coastal rivers. And so after spawning, um, adults typically leave the rivers and return to marine waters to their summer feeding grounds north in the Gulf of Maine. Oop, I'm sorry. And so the adults um, then will migrate south and offshore to winter feeding grounds. And so the juvenile shad... Um, they will leave freshwater and they can spend anywhere from two to five years at sea before returning to freshwater to spawn. Now, in terms of their life history, they fall under, a diadromous fish type typically fall into two categories. There is one that's called semiparous, and these are uh, fish, they, uh, they die after they spawn. And so when you think of semiparous, you typically think of uh, Pacific salmon. However, um, Shad, depending on where they're found, they can actually exhibit this uh, life history as well. Typically, uh, shad that are found in the southern portion of their range, uh, typically populations south of Cape Hatteras, 
um, they will actually uh, they actually are Samuel Paris. Now the other type is Iteroparis, which are these are fish that are capable of spawning multiple times throughout their lives, and so shad populations that are north of Cape Hatteras, so typically in the Mid Atlantic and in the Northeast, are actually Iteroparis. So the type of fish that you find, uh, you know, here in New England and up in Canada, they're capable of spawning multiple times. Hey John, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. Your camera is off. I don't know if that's by design, but uh, we can't we can't see you. Yeah, that, yeah, it's because unfortunately I've got a glare in the uh, in my room. <laughs> Not okay. a problem. All right. Um, so taking it here to Massachusetts, you know, where can you find American shad? And so here I have a map of Massachusetts, and I've colored uh, various watersheds that either currently have shad populations or are, are known to have shad populations. And so I've kind of divided them up into uh, three categories here. Um, in terms of viable populations, uh, these are ones that we know have shad, and that's based on both historical and current data and monitoring. And these watersheds are colored green. So we have five of them here. So uh, we have the Connecticut River uh, to the west. It's our inland watershed up north, the Merrimack River. We have the Palmer River, which is actually part of the Narragansett Bay watershed. And then actually uh, locally, we have the North and South Rivers. Uh, the next category I have here is what I would classify as remnant or unknown populations. Um, these are watersheds that um, that have shed populations. It's just that the, uh, the uh, size of these populations or the status are not uh, fully known. They believe that um, they are remnant populations and that's based on historic data and uh, anecdotal records. And so these watersheds are actually colored blue. So for example, um, the Shawshine River up north and the Concord River, which are actually uh, part of the greater Merrimack River watersheds. Another local example here is the Jones River in Kingston, as well as the Neponset River, which is part of the Boston Harbor watershed. And then we actually have two major watersheds that are undergoing stock enhancement or restoration efforts. Um, and those are actually and those are actually colored orange. And one is the Charles River uh, in the Boston Harbor watershed, as well as the Taunton River in southeastern Massachusetts. So next, I just I want to talk about um, the the status of shad populations as well as their management. I'm going to kind of take a wide uh, coastal view first, and then I'm going to narrow that focus uh, to the state level. So. Um, Highly migratory fish are actually um, are actually uh, uh, regulated by an organization known as the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. This is a commission of states that are formed to coordinate and manage fishery resources along the Atlantic coast of the U.S. This organization is charged with managing migratory species, which also includes diagemous fish. And this commission works with member states and NOAA to advise and formulate regulations. And this can be accomplished through interstate fishery management plans. And so under these plans, um, member states are required to monitor migratory species populations and report annually to the ASMFC. Member states are also required to develop both habitat and sustainable fishery management plans. And through monitoring and data collection, um, this is actually uh, provided to the ASMFC, and this goes towards developing coastwide stock assessments as well as stock assessment updates. So um, what I have here is I'm going to talk a bit about their uh, population status. So if you look at the map on the left here, the map shows both the historic and current uh, distribution of American shad here on the east coast of North America. And so... Historically, you can see uh, from the map, it's actually uh, outlined in yellow. American shad, uh, they used to range from the Sand Hill River all the way up north into Labrador, down south as far as the Indian, Red, Indian River in, uh, mi in mid-Florida. Today, the shad can be found from the St. Lawrence River to the St. John's River, and that's the, uh, the part of the coast that's outlined in red. So over time, we've seen this contraction of their historic range. And so if you look up above, the graph here, um, I should say that American shad, they historically, and even to this day, they still support important commercial fisheries. And so the graph here, it shows commercial landings uh, after World War II to the present. 
And so as you can see from the, gra from the graph, the landings actually peaked in the late 50s and early 60s. And that much of this was due to foreign factory trawlers that were fishing within U.S. territorial waters. The landings declined sharply uh, during the 60s and 70s. And this was until the passage of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which established a 200-mile exclusive economic zone around uh, the countries. And this effectively removed the foreign fleets from U.S. territorial waters. Now, initially, this resulted in an acute recovery of many stocks. However, stocks declined coastwide starting from the mid-80s all the way to the present. And so in 2020, the ASMSC completed the benchmark coastwide stock assessment for American Shad, in which, you know, again, they received data from all coastal states on historical and current commercial and recreational fisheries. And so the overall findings from the assessment indicated that shad populations along the East Coast are likely at all-time lows. And the assessment identified several threats that have been hindering recovery efforts. And these include directed overfishing, inadequate fish passage, predation, pollution, uh, water usage, changing oceanic conditions, as well as climate change. So next I'm gonna take um, management from the federal level down to the state level here. So the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries is the regulatory authority that's charged with managing coastal diadromous fish runs. And so the statutes that are described in the Massachusetts General Laws, particularly chapter 130, they define the scope of our management, which includes uh, providing and maintaining fish passage as outlined in section 19, uh, maintaining existing populations and creating new ones where feasible in section 93. Um, section 94 tends to pertain mostly towards river herring um, in which uh, DMF can grant authority to municipalities to control and regulate their alway fisheries as well as imposing sanctions for violations as outlined in section 95. So here, these are the current regulations for shad in Massachusetts. Um, there is no directed commercial fishery for shad in Massachusetts. This was actually effectively banned in 1987 when the state passed regulations banning the use of nets for commercially harvesting striped bass, but this was also applied to shad and for river herring as well. So today, uh, shad can be harvested for recreational purposes using hook and line. Um, the harvest and possession of American shad is allowed from only two rivers. It's our largest rivers, the Connecticut and the Merrimack River. And so the regulations are shown here. It's, <clears throat> it's a year long season. Um, there's no minimum size limit and there's a daily possession limit of three fish. And so Recreational fishery is allowed in all other waters. However, it's only catch and release. And that's largely due to either the unknown status of these populations or the assumption that these populations are small. So I'm going to talk about my agency here. Um, in particular, um, I work for the Diadromous Fisheries Project. Um, we have a staff of six people, uh, four biologists, as well as two engineers that uh, comprise our fishway crew. And so our main objectives as outlined in chapter 130 is to maintain and en enhance existing runs, to restore historically important runs and to create new ones where feasible, as well as to co conduct population monitoring and research to support resource management. So next I'll talk about the monitoring. Um, I'm first gonna talk about um, monitoring that we do collaboratively with other um, agencies. And I'm gonna talk about our two largest watersheds. So I'm first gonna talk about the monitoring that's conducted at the Connecticut River. And so this is one of two rivers in Massachusetts that's monitored for adult spawning stock abundance, as well as for sampling for population demographics. Uh, this information uh, is incorporated into the ASMFC Coastwide Stock Assessment. And so, Monitoring is actually conducted at the fish lift in Holyoke, which is shown on the map here at this red star. Um, the Connecticut is a, it's one of our main, it's our primary donor system. We actually uh, trap fish at the lift at Holyoke and they'll get trucked um, and distributed to uh, many of the tributaries within the greater watershed shown on the map here. 
but we've also used this as a donor system to stock in other Massachusetts and New England watersheds, such as the Taunton River, which I'll discuss later in this presentation. Um, also, historically, the Connecticut River was used as a donor system for augmenting existing populations, as well as creating new populations. Oops, sorry about that. In other parts of the country. Um, and I'll get to this a little later on in the presentation as well. And so next I'll talk about our other major watershed, the Merrimack River. So this is the other one that's represented in the ASMSC coastwide stock assessment. And so like the Connecticut, monitoring is conducted at the fish lift at the Essex Dam in Lawrence, again, shown by the red star on the map. Um, they also, so they monitor for adult spawning run size as well as they sample for population demographics data as well. And so the Merrimack is also our, one of our major donor systems as well. Um, again, it's mainly for uh, seeding tributaries within the greater uh, Merrimack River, as well as for stocking in neighboring watersheds, both in New Hampshire and in Maine. But we've also used this uh, to help restore a shed to the Charles River. And I'll talk about that more uh, later in this presentation as well. So here, um, I wanted to show, these are actually the numbers of spawning adult shad that have been passing upstream um, at the lifts on both the Connecticut River, which is actually shown by the blue graph. And this has been going on since 1962. And the Merrimack River, which is shown in red uh, since 1983. Um, down below, you can see the uh, what uh, the time series mean, which is the average annual number of adults that have passed upstream for both of these rivers over the course of these monitoring periods. And so, as you can see from the numbers here, um, the Connecticut River has a substantially larger uh, population than the Merrimack River does. And so, um, as you can see over time, um, the numbers of fish that are have been uh, returning year after year, it's been highly variable. Um, one caveat to kind of note that is in these low points in 2005 and 2006, um, the lifts were either damaged or they were inoper inoperable, and that was actually due to historic flooding um, and very high flows. Um, so they had difficulty passing fish uh, during those two years. But the uh, so to really indicate whether you know the populations, how like what are the trends of these two populations over time. Um, what I did was I uh, actually fitted regression lines over these two uh, time series. And so judging from these, uh, these trend lines here, um, the data seems to indicate that, you know, over time, these, these populations have been on an upward trend, albeit it's uh, based on a, a low to modest level of increase. <clears throat> So next I wanted to talk about, um, this is actually a more recent survey. It's one that I actually started um, to monitor shad and small coastal rivers. This is an electrofishing survey um, that I initiated in 2016. And, we're actually, and here we're actually monitoring shad in both the North and South River watersheds. And so <clears throat> the purpose of this survey was to document the presence of American shad in both of these uh, rivers as well as to estimate abundance and to collect biological information to characterize these populations. And so we're using, in this uh, for this survey, we're actually using electrofishing. And so um, this next part here is actually, it's a, I have a, a brief video clip. I'm gonna, it's basically, it shows how electrofishing works. So what we're actually doing is, there's actually a group of us, we're forming a line and we're actually uh, marching our way upstream. This is actually in the South River. Um, the person in the middle of the line is actually using a uh, electrofisher, which is actually discharging 400 volts of direct current into the water. It creates an electrical field. And so when the fish um, uh, get brought into the field, they actually get drawn towards us. And when they get very close, they come to the surface. And when they do so, we try to catch them with the nets. So I'm going to try to play this and hopefully uh, you'll be able to see this. Um, hopefully you've got uh, uh, good uh, uh, run times on your computer. So here we go. Um, so there's an anode that's in the water. 
Um, it's being swept back and forth, and that's emitting the field. You can see the fish are starting to react. And so here, there's a couple of shad that got captured into the nets. And so once we do capture shad, we actually, we turn the field off. We actually process the fish right there on the spot. We'll uh, typically, I'll move over to the bank. I'll get out my measuring board. And so we'll collect uh, biological data, including the sex of the fish. We'll measure the fish to see how long they are. We'll collect scales as well as a fin clip. Um, and then once we do that, I'll, uh, when we release the fish, they swim on and then we uh, proceed till we get to the end of our sampling transect. So here, um, the map here actually shows the, the North and South River watersheds. And so the, uh, the orange boxes actually show our sampling transects. We sample uh, from the head of tide up to basically the first obstruction, which is basically there are two dams on both of these rivers. So, and so for estimating population, instead of actually getting actual counts, like we do with the fish lifts, we're actually using an index called a catch per unit effort. So what it is, is um, the Electra Fisher actually records the amount of time that we actually spend fishing. Um, and so at the end of our sampling transect, we record that time as well as the number of shad that we actually capture. And so the catch per unit effort index is basically, it's the number of shad per unit time, or in this case, it's the number of shad per minute. And so I have two graphs here. The one at the top um, is uh, for the north or Indian Head River, and the bottom is for the south. And so the uh, the index scores here, these are actually mean annual catch per unit effort scores with error bars associated with them. And so using these uh, indices, you can actually track them over time uh, to see, you know, which direction they're going. And you know, and these basically suggest whether the uh, population is actually increasing or decreasing over time. So if, for the Indian Head River, this top graph, you know, from 2016 to 2020, the index was going up, suggesting that the population has been increasing. It then drops down 21, 2021 and 2022, and then a small increase last year. Um, the South River, um, Kind of a similar trend, except we saw a decrease from 2016 to 2018. It then increases again uh, up to 2020. And like the Indian head, it drops again from 2021 to 22 and then increases again in 2023. Now, the, the scales that we collect from the shad, they actually, we can use them to age the fish and to tell how old they are. But we can also, because these shad are also um, iteroparous and they're capable of spawning multiple times, we can actually get the repeat spawning, we can actually get the spawning history of the fish. And so what we found is that the typical range of ages for these fish in both of these rivers ranges from three years, which are typically males, all the way up to nine years of age. And a, a lot of those older fish tend to be females, but we do get some older males as well. And... In terms of repeat spawning, some of these individuals they've we found have spawned up to four times previously. Which, if you go back to that uh, first map that I showed you, where of the uh, life history of their migrations, it's pretty uh, remarkable to think that some of these fish they've run this gam this you know this gamut you know three four times and they've still come managed to get back uh, to spawn again. It's really uh, it's really quite uh, remarkable. So the title of my talk, you know, is uh, Shad, America's Founding Fish. Well, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a historical context to that. Um, you know, it was documented that George Washington was an avid shad fisherman. He marveled at the experience of catching these, you know, feisty and flavorful fish. And it was documented that during the Revolutionary War, American shad had helped feed the Continental Army at Valley Forge in 1778, and this was known as the Valley Forge fish story. And so stories such as this led author John McPhee to call them America's founding fish. Well, I'd like to also propose another um, argument uh, to support this claim, and that is, um, you know, shad, as well as their cousins, the river herring, 
They were also among the first species to be involved in stocking operations to either augment existing populations or to even create new ones. And so for shad, um, their rearing and stocking dates back as early as 1871, and, though, and that was done at hatcheries established at these six uh, donor sites that are shown on the map here, uh, including the Connecticut River. And so at these sites, um, shad were reared as fry, and then they were transferred to various locations throughout the country. And so as I as you can see here, these are actually records of shad that were actually reared from the Connecticut River and then transplanted to various locations throughout the country. So this actually doesn't so the green stars here, this actually doesn't show the uh, the other sites as well. I mean, if I put all those on here, this whole map would probably be littered with stars everywhere. So the green stars, they represent shad that were transferred um, from the Connecticut River to recipient sites, including the Mississippi River watershed, as far as Colorado, and even a couple trips overseas to Germany. Um, and this, of course, was done with advances in transportation, you know, post-Industrial Revolution. Um, these stockings did prove su successful to some degree um, and even created some landlocked populations as well. But if you notice on the map here, the red stars on the West Coast, um, these were actually uh, shed populations that were actually su um, successfully uh, established. Um, and this included the Sacramento River um, 1881, the Columbia River in 1885, and all the way up as far north as Alaska. And if you actually did run genetics testing on these fish, you can actually trace their origin back to these recipient sites on the East Coast. So next, I'm going to talk um, about, um, you know, propagation and restoration on the local level here. And so I have two case studies here that I'm going to briefly go through. Uh, the first is the Charles River. Uh, this actually began in 2004. Um, this was actually cooperative work between uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it was funded through hub line mitigation money. And so from 2006 through 2016, um, Shad were actually collected from the Merrimack River. They were trucked to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Hatchery in Nashua for egg hatching and fry rearing. And then those fry would be transplanted back into the Charles River. Now, to determine whether or not these fry um, were actually um, successfully returning back to the Charles River as adults, what we would do is that prior to their release, we would actually, the fry would actually be bathed in a chemical called oxytetracycline or OTC. It's a chemical that actually settles into certain bony structures of the fish. And in, in this case, um, they would, um, the mark could be found in the otoliths of the fish, which is basically the ear bones of the fish. So they would be bathed in this chemical, then they would be released into the river, which you can see these folks here, they're kind of uh, fire hosing the fish into the Charles River. And then, from 2011 uh, up to the present, we would actually conduct electrofishing in the Lower Charles looking for adults. Um, we would collect any adults that we would find, and then we would actually extract the otoliths from the adults, and we would actually examine them to see if they actually bared the OTC or oxytetracycline mark. And so from there, we could actually determine like what percentage of the fish sampled were uh, from hatchery origin, versus ones that we would consider to be wild, and those would be the fish that did not have this mark. And so we were actually, pretty much every year that we've been doing the electrofishing, we have been capturing adults that have this OTC mark. So it's actually documenting that these, these fry that were raised in the hatchery, they're actually successfully imprinting uh, to the Charles River and then returning there as adults. And so we do have some future um, restoration actions in the Charles River. Uh, we, we've actually uh, doing a feasibility study for removing the Watertown Dam. And we're also looking to provide passage uh, at two dams further upstream, namely the Metropolitan Circular Dam, as well as the Silk Mill Dam. And so the next one I'm going to talk about real quick is... Uh, is restoring shad to the Taunton River. This one actually only started uh, two years ago. Again, this was an agreement between the Division of Marine Fisheries, our sister agency at Mass Wildlife, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to transplant juvenile shad into the Taunton. 
Uh, the donor source for this one is actually the Connecticut River. And so in 2022, we, we actually planted over 5 million fry and 77,000 juveniles into the Taunton River. And then basically to look for juvenile returns, we've been conducting each SANE surveys to try and capture juvenile shad. And so we've been doing it at various locations along the Taunton River. And so in 2022, we actually captured nine juveniles in, in the summer and seven more in the fall. Last year, we uh, transplanted over uh, uh, 5 million fry into the Taunton River, uh, uh, although unfortunately we didn't capture any uh, in our same surveys last year. <laughs> so just to kind of, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, so just for future directions, uh, we're going to continue fry stocking in the Taunton River watershed, and we're going to we're going to continue to monitor for juveniles and eventually for adult returns. And then we actually have a couple of other restoration projects that are currently in the works, um, actually locally here for the North and South River watershed. Um, one is going to be uh, uh, providing fish passage improvements in the South River. And this is namely through the removal of the Veterans War Memorial Park Dam, which I believe is going to be happening later this year. And in doing so, it'll open up an additional half mile of spawning habitat for shad all the way up to Chandler's Pond. And then also for the Indian Head River, we're looking, um, there are plans in motion for improving fish passage there, um, basically uh, uh, to improve passage at two uh, dams there and, and hopefully to make available an additional, almost three miles of additional spawning habitat there as well. And so finally, I'm just going to uh, wrap this up with, um, I'd say for future directions and monitoring, um, I'd like to call perhaps the next step in the evolution of biological monitoring, and that's through eDNA, which uh, my friend and colleague James will uh, certainly be talking about as this is the uh, crux of his uh, PhD research. And with that, I, I thank you all for listening. Thanks so much, John. That was very fascinating. Um, James, while you're getting geared up here and screen sharing, um, John, I do have a couple, maybe just maybe quick one or two questions here. Um, do adult fish, do adult shad return annually or are they more on like a five-year cycle? Um, what we have, well, a bit, kind of based on what we've seen from looking at scales, um, you know, they, they don't necessarily return uh, consecutively year after year. Um, some, you, sometimes we'll see maybe like a year, um, sometimes it's almost like, I kind of like almost like saying taking a year off, but, um, it's like, uh, if you have a fish that's, uh, say a six year old fish or say a seven year old fish, you know, they spawn for the first time at five years of age, they may not necessarily have spawned at age six. Um, so sometimes, you know, there can be a gap in terms of responding. And I guess really the short answer is, you know, it's not uh it's not consecutive okay okay understood thank you and and again mm -hmm. folks um thanks for putting in some questions we'll definitely have more time for questions at the end so please continue to to type them in um and so uh so that's great um thanks so much john um and we'll get back to you with some more questions at the end so james um thanks again for taking the time tonight mm -hmm. and uh go ahead and fire up your screen and uh take it away All right. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, my name is James Garner, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, and I am co-advised by Michelle Stoudinger and Dr. Adrian, Dr. Michelle Stoudinger and Dr. Adrian Jordan. And um, before I get going, I just wanted to say that none of this work that I'm going to be talking about today would have been possible without John Shepard uh, and Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. So I am ever grateful for their support. Um, today, I am going to be talking to y'all about using passive genetic tools, or environmental DNA, or eDNA, to estimate the seasonal abundance of American shad. Um, and I also ask that y'all uh, bear with me. I'm recovering from a bit of a chest cold, so apologies if I have to mute myself to cough or something like that. Um, and so for my portion of the talk, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about monitoring. John gave a great foundation about what you know, monitoring and management looks like in Massachusetts and along the Atlantic seaboard, which made my talk easier to prepare. So thanks, John. And um, uh, then I'm going to be talking about what environmental DNA is and what it 
what it can do. And then I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, what's going on in the North and South River watersheds utilizing environmental DNA. Um, these are four of the species of fish that I focus on. And obviously today I'm going to be targeting um, American shad for this talk. Um, and I think it was Brian earlier saying that these pictures are used <laughs> for everybody's presentation. They're they're beautiful. Um, this this whole project began when I was a biological technician for the Mass Division Marine Fisheries. I was actually working with John um, back in 2019 um, as a uh, fisheries tech, and uh, you know time passed. And eventually I began my PhD and I reached out to the Diadromus fish team to ask them if they'd be interested in pursuing some environmental DNA research. And uh, much to my delight, they said yes. Um, and so quickly, this is a really busy uh, figure, but it's, it's basically showing you all the steps that it takes to get to any kind of restoration action or... Um, formulation of fisheries monitoring rules or regulations. And um, I just kind of want to bring your attention to the information gathering part. It's at the very beginning of the process and it's critical. Without information, it's really difficult to make informed decisions about how, about what decisions to make and what directions to go with your decisions. Um, and all that is to say, without good information, it's hard to make good decisions about restoration actions and fisheries management. And John set me up perfectly. Um, a, a more modern approach to biological monitoring is using environmental DNA. And in the picture on the left is uh, myself and some of my uh, UMass uh, undergraduate technicians helping me collect eDNA samples in the Jones River watershed. And then on the right is a picture that gets used for basically every eDNA talk. Whoever made it was great. Showing you that like, it's it's a good graphical representation of what eDNA is. But what is environmental DNA? eDNA is essentially <clears throat> genetic material collected from an environment as opposed to an organism itself. Being alive in any given environment um, is a messy process. Everyone and everything um, that is alive is fusing genetic material into their environment at any given time and place. Some organisms shed DNA faster than others, um, but it is an inevitable process. And that shedding of that shed DNA is something that we can detect from environmental samples themselves. Um, there are two basic approaches, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of this, but this um, spreadsheet on the left here is a representation of a biodiversity uh, eDNA analysis or the results from that. Um, this was in the, the Jones River watershed, and we detected, you know, dozens of different fish species, um, fish, uh, amphibian, reptile, bird, all kinds of uh, species, and it gives us an understanding of the biodiversity of a given place at a given time. Um, and that's called eDNA metabarcoding. And then there's also single species approaches, which is represented by this brook trout picture. Um, and that's done using what's called qPCR or quantitative polymerase, polymerase chain reaction, which is a mouthful. You don't need to know metabarcoding or qPCR for this talk. Just thought I'd give you that context. So just to recap, it's DNA sourced from environmental samples rather than directly from an organism. And it can inform you about three main things in an environment at a given time and place. It can tell you about species presence. It can give you an understanding of the biodiversity of a place. And it can give you an idea about the relative abundance uh, of species that are there. That comes with a very important caveat. You can't use eDNA in isolation. It has to be calibrated to a standardized technique because what eDNA is giving you is a concentration of DNA per unit volume of water. And that really can't be extrapolated out to abundance without um, context. And so for what I'm going to be talking about a little later, the context for these studies 
were the electrofishing surveys that John and the DMF team um, have been doing for the several years now. One of the best parts about environmental DNA is the ease of sample collection. You literally are dipping a bottle of water or dipping a bottle into water and putting it on ice and filtering it and dealing with the, the laboratory stuff later. So you can collect hundreds of samples, put them in a freezer and you know deal with them when you get to them. This is a picture of me collecting samples in the Jones River watershed. One of the cool things about this is it's it's a pretty accessible technology because you can collect samples using Nestle Pure Life water bottles if you wanted to not go buy a whole bunch of Nalgene bottles and bleach them and clean them every time you wanted to use them. I know Nestle isn't the best company on earth. However, it's been rigorously tested um, by folks in the eDNA world, and it has been found to not contain any traces of, of DNA at all. So if you wanted to implement this in one of your own watersheds, you could just go buy a case of Nestle Pure Life water and start collecting samples of your own, freezing them and shipping them out to somebody to analyze them. So it's it's very it's a very accessible tool and getting the results is oftentimes less time and resource expensive than other fisheries management techniques. So I'm gonna be talking to you guys a little bit about some applications just to see the forest from the trees here and outcomes of eDNA surveys. So obviously one of them is detecting species presence. You can look for rare or endangered species confirmations at a given time and place. You can look for non-indigenous species. You can detect shifts in phenology and species ranges. And what, what phenology is, is just the timing of life history events. So like when a tree leafs out or when a diadromous fish uh, migrates upstream, the timing of that event is a phenological event. Um, you can also detect species range shifts in real time. Um, yeah, like rainbow smelt are their range has moved northward over the past several decades. Um, and a tool like eDNA can help you detect that. You can track species responses to human-induced stressors uh, and habitat uh, degradation, um, like dam removals and climate change. Um, and then you can look at biodiversity and community structure assessments. So you can look at um, how communities shift in response to different stressors. You can establish modern eDNA biodiversity baselines for a given place to continue studying those environments. Like I just mentioned, you can understand ecosystem response to restoration or climate adaptation actions. Um, as I mentioned before, you can use it to estimate species density or abundance, and it can provide a low cost supplement or alternative to other methods. One of my favorite applications, even though it's still in its baby state, baby stages, is ancient DNA. If you had an environment that didn't have any oxygen, um, which is what primarily helps degrade DNA over time, you can take a like a like a glacial lake bed, for example. Um, you could take a sediment core of where those lake beds once were, uh, and then you can get an understanding of what the communities and ecosystems looked like tens of thousands of years ago, because that DNA has been preserved in an anoxic environment or an environment without oxygen, um, which every time I see a paper about this, it just blows my mind that DNA can um, be preserved for that long. DNA is a very hardy, robust molecule, which is why any of this is possible. Terrestrial eDNA. So you can sample sediment, you can sample air, you can even sample things like honey um, to detect what uh, species of flower bees used to make that honey. Um, where the pollen came from, etc. Plant pollinator interactions, um, and if you wanted to, you can do gut composition analyses by examining um, scat and excrement um, from target species. So eDNA sounds like this super, like magic bullet, right? It like it seems like it could do a lot of things uh, for less money um, and less effort, and that's true, partially but it comes with some caveats. Um, this picture to the left is a dead lamprey um, in the Jones River watershed. These are also um, simul parrots. They die after they spawn. 
And if you had a dead organism, it's going to be shedding a lot more genetic material than a living organism, which can contaminate a sample, uh, an environmental DNA sample. So the sample you get could potentially overrepresent the number of species that you have. The, the picture to the right is um, from a near a fish ladder on the Cape, and those are just herring scales. And so having that many herring scales at a time and place, I think an otter had a, a wonderful lunch one day just downstream of the fish ladder, um, can also introduce extra genetic material to an environment. So it has to be any kind of survey that you do with environmental DNA has to be done carefully. Um, <clears throat> and you have to account for things like contamination or overrepresentation with your sampling design. So for what we were doing in the North and South River watersheds, we had two research goals. Um, the first one is, can eDNA be used to monitor for American shad abundance when sampled robustly through time and space? Most eDNA uh, applications to date take a sample at one time and one place to see if you know abundance can be represented. And in the literature, uh, it's controversial. Um, so my, my question was, well, what happens if we take more samples? Um, and then knowing these watersheds from both working with John and the Jones River watershed and the North and South River watersheds, um, when we were designing our survey, um, we, we knew, we wanted to know whether or not American shad are making it upstream of the dams in the South and Indian Head Rivers. They both have fish ladders. And we wanted to see if those fish ladders are actually passing shad upstream. And like I mentioned earlier, sampling design matters. So on the right is just a basic graphical representation of a river. And for every environmental DNA sampling event, we sampled both upstream and downstream of where the electrofishing surveys started. So at the very beginning, John, again, thank you, um, would go collect um, three replicate samples um, from the left side, the middle, and the right side of the stream channel. And then we would do the electrofishing survey. We'd work our way upstream. And at the end of the survey, we would take a sample upstream of these dams. One thing that you may or may not want to know is DNA or environmental DNA kind of flows in plumes. So the reason why we get three samples across a transect is because we want to make sure we're catching some sort of signal um, in these environments and making sure we have the best chance to detect these fish. Um, I stole this from John's presentation. Thanks again, John. Um, just to reorient you to the North and South uh, and Indian Head Rivers and where these sampling locations were. Um, again, those orange boxes are where these transects were. And first I'm gonna talk about the South River Electrofishing Site and eDNA survey. So this pin down here where it says DS is where the electrofishing survey began and we'd walk all the way upstream to the dam. Um, <clears throat> and that's where the electrofishing survey ended and we would collect a water sample upstream of the dam. Um, and so let's talk about presence and absence. On the days, uh, so this is, I'm gonna walk you guys through multiple dates. Um, at the top, you see upstream of dam and downstream of dam. If there's a fish there, it's a positive detection. If there's an X there, there was nothing detected. Um, so the upstream reach is above that dam and the downstream reach is where the eDNA and electrofishing surveys began. So for the first date, um, May 3rd, we got detections downstream of the dam, but not upstream. On the 12th, again, detected them downstream, but not upstream. 19th, same story. 24th, same story. 6th, or excuse me, the 2nd of June, same story. And the 7th of June, same story. So we detected fish every time that we sampled electrofishing downstream where the electrofishing survey began, but never upstream of the dam. So what does that mean? It means that likely, at least on the days that we were sampling, American shad were not making it upstream of that dam. 
Does it mean that definitively there are no fish there? No, it's it's harder to prove absence than it is to prove presence. But it is a good indication that the passability of that fish ladder isn't high for American shad at that given place at these times. And this is to orient you to the Indian Head Electrofishing Survey site. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> downstream pen is where it began. Uh, and this is the Ludham's Ford Dam where the upstream portion of the survey began picture of the of the dam site where the electrofishing survey ended and we would collect our eDNA sample and I believe collect correct me if I'm wrong John we just collected it from the fishway um, as the water was flowing from upstream down anyways at the entrance yep oh sweet thank you John um and so on the first day of sampling we detected shad both upstream and downstream at both upstream and downstream sites. Uh, however, after that, we failed to detect American shad upstream of the dam uh, for any of the dates that we sampled. So again, what does that mean? Uh, it means likely that, you know, either uh, several fish made it up in, earlier in the season, um, or it, it could mean that, you know, passability at that dam is not as efficient as we would hope. Um, it doesn't mean that fish aren't making it up there, uh, like I said before, uh, but it means that we didn't detect fish on any day except for one upstream of that dam. And of note, we um, failed to detect uh, fish in either the upstream or downstream reaches um, starting June 14th. Uh, which is a good indication that American shad are probably out of the system. One of the boons to an environmental DNA survey is how sensitive it can be. Um, it is it is employed a lot of times to target rare or endangered species uh, because of the sensitivity. If you get even one cell of a species of interest in your water or soil or whatever sample, the likelihood that you detect it is is pretty good. This is uh, just another representation um, that is answering our, you know, can eDNA be used to detect um, abundance of American shad? And to the left here, um, on the blue line are our eDNA scores. And you can see that they track our American shad catch per unit effort scores um, pretty closely. This is for the South River. <clears throat> So we're changing from the watershed that we were just looking at. Um, and yeah, one thing to note is that environmental DNA still detected shad after electrofishing surveys um, failed to detect. Does that mean it's better? No, it means that, you know, this could be contamination. An osprey could have, you know, uh, pooped in the in the water upstream of where these were or something like that. But it it is showing us that, you know, they're, there's a high likelihood that American shad were still in this watershed um, for these dates. And then on the right is a linear regression showing the correlation between um, American shad DNA scores and American shad catch per unit effort scores. And in a biological and a natural biological setting, this R squared value of 0.87 is like really high. I was not expecting to get results like this. Um, and what that is saying is that these two things are highly correlated um, so that, you know, while you wouldn't be able to get an exact number by only looking at the environmental DNA um, signature in a watershed, you would be able to get a, a proxy estimate of a relative number of fish that were in that watershed based on the um, results that we got from this survey, which I thought was super cool. Um, and so <clears throat> the future of monitoring, eDNA is not going to replace the things that John and his team are doing at all. Um, actual biological monitoring, being out in the field, boots to the ground is always going to be necessary because as I mentioned before, eDNA can't exist on its own. It has to be calibrated to something. So it'll never replace. However, it can add relevant ecological context and detection power when paired with traditional techniques. Um, for example, we were able to take a quick sample upstream of these dams and find out, you know, 
the passability is probably not great at many of these dam locations, upstream of many of these dam locations. eDNA monitoring can provide managers with real-time functional data to inform critical decisions being made within these uh, watersheds. And with careful and thorough sampling design, eDNA methods can successfully be used to detect species abundance when calibrated to an established methodology, like an electrofishing survey. And finally, um, I'll leave you with this. I'm obviously a big supporter of environmental DNA uh, techniques and methodologies, um, but eDNA monitoring can be more accessible than traditional monitoring techniques. It's increasingly becoming affordable, the lab materials and <clears throat> the expenditures you'd have to make to get this done are going down by the year. The techniques are being consistently refined. My PhD is working to do just that. Um, the, the field sampling is really simple. This picture over to the right is one of my undergrad technicians um, collecting uh, an environmental DNA sample using a Nestle Pure Life water bottle. Um, and it's more cost effective than many uh, alternatives. And like I said, it's not going to replace it, anything, but it does add power to any ongoing monitoring surveys that you might want to implement. I would like to, again, profusely thank the DMF team and especially John Shepard for all the help that they gave me for this effort. Um, without them, none of this would have been possible. Um, twice a week, they're out there helping me collect these eDNA samples, um, along with my advisors, my committee, um, and tons of friends and family. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I should have American Shad there instead of his rainbow smelt, but whatever. It's all right. <laughs> Simpler habitat. Um, yeah, thanks so much, James. It's very fascinating. So we've got a bunch of questions. I'll kind of go through the order that they came in. Um, so some of these earlier ones may be more John oriented and then some of the later ones may be more James oriented. So, but either of you can chime in at any point. So with Shad being introduced in the West Coast, have there been any negative impacts on introducing a non-native species um, to, uh, you know, those other habitats out there? Any negative impacts to their native species on the West Coast? Difficult to say, really. Um, if anything, um, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's really kind of hard to say, especially you know, since they were uh, they were introduced, you know, well over a hundred years ago. Um, you know, it's it's kind of hard to. I mean, I'd have to probably look at some literature to see if uh, if any if uh, if any such uh, you know documentation actually occurred. Um, the one thing I will say is that I think what those um, those uh, stocking operations, I think, were highly successful. I think largely because it was probably conducted at a time where um, the shad they had, um, you know, the connection to the ocean. Um, and I think at the time it was done probably prior to uh, development in those watersheds. Um, Talking to some folks that I know out on the West Coast, you know, when a lot of those uh, dams were put up, even especially some of the larger hydroelectric dams, you know, they, they were done, you know, I believe they were also done with fish passage in mind. So, like, when they built them, they built ladders and such at the same time, as opposed to, you know, when they first built them here on the East Coast, um, you know, fish passage wasn't necessarily something that was taken into consideration when they first built dams here. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, we, and, uh, so we'll do our, our herring counts, um, during the migrational season. Are shad typically counted as herring, uh, during the herring counts? There's probably some of our herring volunteers here tuned into this tonight. Well, I would say that, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, I, I would say that, uh, you know, because shad, uh, they only, uh, typically exist, um, you know, in a, in a handful of, of runs, um, you know, the probability of actually detecting them in most locations is probably, uh, is probably very low. Um, I know that there are volunteer counts that do occur at the South River. And, um, and while it's certainly possible, I mean, I know that I, because I know where the counting location is. I know it's, it's at the uh, Veterans War Memorial Park Dam. Um, and, Oftentimes when we uh when I'm out there electrofishing, we finish up our survey and we're pulling up and we're getting out of the water there. I on occasion I will look through the logbook that's there. Um 
once in a while, I will see uh, someone, you know, observe the shad in the vicinity. Um, they didn't necessarily, but it wasn't necessarily something that they uh, registered within their count. Um, I would say that, you know, of course, shad and river herring look very, very similar. It's just um, oftentimes I think shad can be distinguishable from other river herring because they look like a giant river herring. You know, they're, they're typically uh, significantly larger than um, your your a typical adult owlwife or blueback. Understood. I've heard them referred to as the king herring before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if a adult shad reaches um, an impoundment and can't get upstream, would they still spawn downstream of that impoundment or would they give up? Uh, from what I've read from the literature, um, shad typically, they're kind of like blueback herring. They, they typically tend to uh, spawn in more river rind sections. So they tend to prefer, uh, you know, flowing water as opposed to alewives, which typically prefer still water environments that you find in the ponds and lakes. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, so, I, you know, I, you know, it was interesting that James's data did show that, um, you know, he did document uh, or it did suggest that, you know, some shad have ascended that ladder at Ludham's Ford. Um <clears throat> And it's possible they could have, you know, made their way further upstream to some of the further upstream sections, maybe towards State Street and Cross Street. Um, otherwise, if they didn't find, you know, preferable habitat there, it's possible they could have gone back down the ladder again. And because uh, that that area downstream of, of Elm Street there, that's where most of the fishery occurs. Okay. Um, thanks, John. Uh, so bycatch of american shad i know that is a, a talking point for our river herring species is that um, something that is going on and if so there's some numbers to support that so um it is one of the um you know it is one of the uh, uh factors that is listed within the asmfc stock assessment um for shad um i mean there are directed commercial fisheries for shad but it also has been documented that that they are incidentally caught in ocean intercept fisheries, namely uh, fisheries that are targeting Atlantic herring and Atlantic mackerel. Um, oftentimes, what we you know, because I will, because um, oftentimes I have to write up compliance reports for the ASMFC every year, and so I have to go into the federal databases to look at, um, you know, because they they do they monitor these um, these fisheries. So I have to look to see if, you know, shad and river herring are being caught. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, I mean, they will, they are um, caught from time to time within these fisheries. It's uh, it's kind of a tricky thing because um, oftentimes you'll, um, you'll have uh, many trips where they're not catching them. And then, you know, one vessel uh, is towing in an area where it happens to be a hot spot where, they have to be there at a particular time and they will catch them. So it, it does occur, um, you know, to what magnitude it's not, uh, it's not fully understood yet, but we know it does occur. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, and so this actually, this may be a question. And James, I see that you've, you're answering a few of those on the, in the chat and that's great. Thank you. Um, James could drones or, other types of technology be used to help you know, gather uh, information, specifically eDNA, um, uh, uh, for monitoring? Uh, I do think that if you had a powerful enough drone, you could use it to, to collect a water sample. Um, and I know that, you know, I have a, a drone that I use for fun to take pictures and videos of American Shad migrating up the Connecticut River. Um, so you can use it to confirm presence, um, definitely. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know if anybody's, um, implemented drones for eDNA surveys, but, uh, it's definitely something that could be possible. Okay. I guess while you're here, James, um, uh, has any electroshocking or eDNA, um, I guess if both of you sampling been conducted on any of the other tributaries of the North River, like first, second or third Herring Brooks? Uh, for eDNA, at least the um, the sampling that uh, was done was only in the the sites John and I mentioned. However, you know, it's as easy as going and dipping a bottle, 
to to collect more if there's if there's funding for a project. So so yeah. Okay. Um and as for myself, uh I I haven't conducted it in, in uh any areas outside of uh the south the main stem of the South River and the Indian Head River as well. Um I'm sure that if I if we spoke to our uh, counterparts at Mass Wildlife, uh, particularly Steve Hurley, he's the Southeast District uh, Fisheries Manager, um, you know, because they conduct trout surveys, um, you know, all throughout uh, Southeast Massachusetts. I, I would certainly, I'm willing to bet that um, you know he's conducted surveys up there, and and it's possible he could have uh, encountered Chad too. Um, I've certainly heard anecdotal evidence of or sightings of Shad in some of these other tributaries of the North River. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so prior to man-made dams, um, how did Shad or other migratory species navigate uh, beaver-made dams? That's a good question. Um, I, would, I would probably... Uh, <laughs> I could only guess that uh, by saying that, um, yeah, perhaps beavers uh, were the, uh, they might have been the precursor to uh, man-made obstructions. <laughs> um, I, I would say maybe perhaps for shad, it might not have been, uh, and for blueback herring, it might not have been as, it may not have been as, um, they may not have been as negatively affected, you know, because they're primarily looking uh, for river rind sections of river for spawning. You know, but when you think of other species like owl wives and such that, you know, they're trying to get up to the ponds and lakes, um, it might have had a more or even Atlantic salmon, because um, oftentimes, you know, uh, salmon, you know, it's it's said that uh, salmon, you know, they'll they'll imprint to a particular location on a stream. You know, they're trying to get back to that very spot. Um, and so when you think about places like the Merrimack or even, uh, you know, the Connecticut, they're spawning way up in the upper reaches of those watersheds. And so if they're blocked up <laughs> uh, somewhere downstream, you know, that's that's difficult for them. Understood. Um, what percentage of the thousands of fish are, um, oh, I'm sorry, let's see. Automated count station in Pembroke or Shad? Oh, so the counting station um, in Pembroke going into that pond there. Um, uh, is there a way to identify how, you know, what percentage of those are Shad? Okay, well, the um, the ladder there, um, because I believe that was replaced with the steep pass ladder. The one thing about um, Shad is that... Uh, they're not very good at ascending ladders, um, which is really kind of ironic because if you, <laughs> for for any fisherman out there, they would certainly know you hook one on a rod and reel, they give you a ferocious fight. Yet for some reason, they, they're they not very good at ascending ladders for some reason. So, um, you know, whereas uh, river herring are. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, and to be honest with you, the, uh, the system that we have up there, it's a, uh, it's a multi-channel uh, electronic counter. So it's a series of, it's basically a series of tunnels that are only four inches in diameter. So really they, I would say by and large, they wouldn't be large enough really to allow a shad to pass through them. So even if the shad could get up the ladder, they wouldn't be able to get through the counter. <laughs> Understood. I, yeah, that, that makes sense. I've been to that site before. If, you, if you're not getting uh, attacked by the, the mute swan that's up there. <laughs> Um, let's see. Do we know that electrofishing is harmless? Does it hurt the fish? Well, the, um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different things that kind of go into, um, electrofishing. Uh, first of all, it's, um, you know, every species is different in terms of their sensitivity to, um, elect to electricity. Um, one thing in general that we do find is that the larger the fish, uh, the more they tend to be affected by it because they have a larger surface area. And so the larger the surface area, the more they get affected by the field. And so when we do our, um, and also there's other factors that, uh, that come into play as well, such as the conductivity of the water um, and things like that. But the, um, so when we, uh, when we're out electrofishing, so 
the the uh, the apparatus that we use. It's a it's an anode that goes into the water. It's basically a metal ring. It transmits the electric field, and so I would say that the the main the main influence of the field is probably about a five foot radius from the anode itself. And again, that can be different depending on the conductivity of the water or depending what's in the water. Like if there's an iron rebar pole or rod or something like that, it can actually send it. The field can actually go further afield. But um, so typically what we see is um, when the fish first sense the field, um, which can be out beyond that five foot radius, they can sense the field. They usually do one of two things. They can either flee the area or they get drawn into the field. And so when they get drawn into the field, that's a, a state known as taxis. And so that's really what we try to do is we try to bring them towards us. And so when they get very close, they come to the surface of the water. And at that point, we try to capture them into, in the nets. Um, the one thing we try to avoid is um, we try to avoid them having coming actual physical contact with the anode or the ring in the water because that basically what happens is then the fish then seizes up. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been electrocuted before. I mean, um, I certainly have and uh, probably explains why I am the way I am. But uh, but when you get electrocuted, you know, oftentimes say if you're grabbing a, a, a live wire and you can't let it go, um, even though you're convulsing and shaking, you can't let it go because all your muscles seize up. That's what they call tetany. And so we try to avoid that because if that does happen, it just, it takes longer to revive the fish um, to do so. And, and, and oftentimes a prolonged exposure to that type of state can cause internal damage. It can kill the fish. Um, one thing I will say is, um, especially late in the season, sometimes we'll capture post-spawned uh, shad. You know, they've spawned and you know, the, the the stress of the spawning, you know, really takes a toll on them physically. They're weakened. They get hit with the electric field. And, you know, um, and so sometimes even uh, even a short exposure to that, it takes them takes us longer to revive the fish sometimes. So um, we try to avoid that when possible. So basically, when the fish come up, we try to capture them as quickly as possible. And then we do that. We shut off the field. Understood. Thanks, John. Um, and I know uh, there was a, a question earlier about um, uh, the introduction of non-native species into other habitats um, uh, uh, that has been done um, in the past, to, in the present. Uh, what approaches are being taken as to not repeat some of these um, situations where introduction of other species have been maybe had a detrimental effect on a habitat? If there is an answer to to that um, in your guys's line of work um i could try to take a crack at this um <clears throat> uh, sometimes what i've seen uh in terms of introductions just based on some of my experiences is um sometimes we'll see like uh not necessarily uh like say other fish but sometimes like like invertebrates uh some of the things that come into mind um, are examples, say, would be like uh, zebra mussels, um, you know, and the damage that they've caused out, you know, in the Great Lakes. And even, you know, they've been found even in Western Massachusetts. Uh, more locally here um, would be another example would be Asian clam, which is another uh, invasive species that's been introduced as well. And and I think oftentimes, you know, they're, they're coming in from... Um, say, you know, boats that, you know, they've been fishing in one location where they might have picked up larvae or so. And then, you know, they're, then they go and fish in another location. The, you know, the larvae get exposed, the water get released, and then they settle. And now they're starting to establish in places like that. So it's, you know, oftentimes it's just, you know, care and cleaning, you know, um, of, of your equipment. Uh, we do it too. Like, for example, like I know some states they've banned felt soles on waders because they can pick up organisms, you know, from the substrate and then you can actually introduce them into other places too. So that's, you know, so yeah, some states have done that, um, you know, to prevent the transmission of, you know, uh, foreign organisms from one place to another. Makes sense. Um, maybe James, you could, um, 
take a crack at this one. So um, obviously with the, the dam removals being um, uh, a, a major focus of the watershed as well as other watersheds around here, um, in your professional opinion, and, and I know that you alluded to some of this in your research, would the removal of some of these dams open up uh, more shed habitat and hopefully increase the populations in, in our local waterways? Uh, I mean, in my opinion, I would say absolutely. Uh, John just mentioned that, you know, shad are riverine spawners. Uh, so, you know, the more habitat they have access to to do that, the the the, the more spawning they might potentially be able to do. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, John. No, I would certainly agree with that. And it's, you know, certainly not for shad, but I mean, not just for shad, but I would say for most species in general, you know, I, I think that's one really... That's one great application for, you know, eDNA. And I know I've seen some of James's uh, preliminary results and he certainly documented, um, you know, the increase in uh, species distributions, uh, for example, like in the Jones River, uh, you know, prior to and after they removed, you know, dams at like Elm Street and, and things like that. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, dam removals, I think really have, uh, it's a net overall benefit, you know, not just for shad, but for, all, you know, I'd say for, you know, for aquatic species in general. Absolutely. Looks like um, one more, and thanks guys for really fielding all these questions. Looks like one more. Uh, is electrofishing um, AC or DC? Uh, we, yeah, we use direct current. So basically, um, you know, we when we do our surveys, we, um, we actually follow the guidelines that were established by our sister agency at Pass Wildlife. They've been doing these these types of surveys for you know for decades and so they've really kind of gotten the uh the settings um you know down to a really down to a science now so it's you know we typically use like 400 volts of direct current um you know and then you know various other things of you know uh uh 25 duty cycle and uh 100 watts of power okay um thanks john it looks like that's about it um i i know some folks out there have some hands raised i can't turn on your guys's mics if you can quickly type something in uh the q a uh really quick um then we might be able to get to it so maybe if you can do that right now what i will do is i, I will say thank you to our sponsors um and uh and then if there's any last minute questions we can get to those um and so once again thanks so much clean harbors um as well as the massachusetts cultural councils of situate hanover marshall pembroke rockland and duxbury thank you so much for your continued support of um uh, educational programs just like this so um with that it looks like uh there's been a lot of folks that have been sticking around for the Q&A, which is great. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Um, a big special thank you to James and John. You guys were both uh, incredibly knowledgeable. And uh, and I personally learned a whole lot from this. And I know a lot of other folks did as well. So um, thanks to the both of you for for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. And thanks yep. for having great me. Great job. Too. Yeah. And thanks so much, uh, Steve, for joining in Mass Audubon. It's oh, always yeah. great to absolutely. Always always great to partner with you guys. Um, so um, next week's, uh, so thanks to all of you um, for being here. Um, next week's program, uh, February 7th, What Good Are Mosquitoes? Um, a fresh perspective on the world's most hated insect. Um, we will be joined by Blake Dinius, the Plymouth County entomologist, um, and he's going to go over um, uh, a little bit about why uh, such a hated species and um, how many mosquitoes play a critical role in a healthy functioning ecosystem. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, low natural diversity in human modified landscapes favors some species over others. How have humans impacted our natural world in ways that favors disease vectors. Uh, can we reverse this trend? Uh, so join us for a fresh take uh, uh, and look into uh, oh, the world's most hated <laughs> hated insect from a conservationist perspective. So uh, that will be uh, next week's program. Um, great. Once again, John, James, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and Steve, it's good to see you. We'll probably see you next week. Right. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much for Thanks, tuning in, everyone. Have hey, a take good care. Have a Thank good night. Thank you. Thank you.